This is Friday, October 18th, 2013. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today State Senator Michael F. Rush. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? I was born November 30th, 1973. And where were you born? I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, what part of Boston? I was born uh, at St. Margaret's Hospital in Dorchester. Mm -hmm. And were you in Dorchester growing up? No, I grew up in the neighborhood of West Roxbury in Boston, uh, where I currently still reside. Okay. And your current marital status? I am uh, happily married. And how many children? I have two children. Mm -hmm. I have a 10-month-old son. Uh, his name is James Joseph Rush, the second. And I have a, a three-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. Her name is Kira Rose Rush. Oh, wonderful. And tell us what growing up in Boston was like, especially West Roxbury. Absolutely wonderful. I'm mm -hmm. the youngest of six children mm -hmm. and uh, grew up in an absolutely great household uh, on a wonderful street, great neighborhood, and uh, we, we loved growing up in Boston. My parents uh, mm -hmm. were terrific always. So. And what did your father do for a living? My father was uh, a chief probation officer of the West Roxbury District Court, mm -hmm. where he had worked for uh, 43 years as a probation officer. Wow. And what, uh, how about your mother? My mother uh, uh, raised uh, six children mm -hmm. and uh, th then became a teacher's assistant in uh, the town of Dover, mm -hmm. so where uh, she's been for 20 years. And where in Dover does she work? She's right in Dover Center at the uh, Dover Child Development Center. Oh, nice. Dover, Massachusetts. Okay. So. Where and when did you enter the military? Joined the uh, United States Navy mm -hmm. in 1994. And I did all my processing work uh, in Boston. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to join the military? Uh, mostly because uh, my father was a Korean War Navy vet mm -hmm. who served on the USS uh, John W. Weeks during Korea. And uh, my mother's father was also a, uh, a Navy vet of World War II. He was a naval officer. Mm -hmm. So that was those direct influences, mostly my father, <clears throat> and then uh, my father uh, also had uh, two older brothers mm -hmm. who served in the military during World War II, uh -huh. and he had an older sister who served in the uh, Navy during World War II. Oh, wow. And then he had two, um, two of his sister's husbands, mm -hmm. my uncle Jim Cooney yeah. and my uncle Ed Driscoll, were uh, both highly decorated uh, World War II veterans. So as a child growing up, I had all these World War II veterans who mm -hmm. were my aunts and uncles uh, present, as well as my father, who was a Korean War Navy vet. Are any of them still with us? They are not. They oh. are all. My father was the very last one. Mm -hmm. So you had a long, strong military tradition. Very much so. Were you a high school graduate by this time? Um, yes, graduate of uh, Catholic Memorial High School mm -hmm. in Boston, uh, class of 1992. And what did you do between Catholic Memorial and when you enlisted? I uh, enrolled and uh, was attending Providence College in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, uh -huh. and uh, came across a program called the SAM, Navy SAM program, and that program consisted of uh, during the summer of uh, you could, uh, during the summer of college, go away to active duty boot camp uh -huh. and then be assigned to a unit. So uh, I, I enlisted mm -hmm. in this program. And between the summer of my sophomore and junior year, mm -hmm. I uh, went to Naval uh, Training Command, Orlando, Florida. And I arrived uh, there on May 25th and returned to Boston on August 25th, mm -hmm. as I remember it, and uh, then uh, went back to my junior year at Providence College. Well, what was that summer like? It was, uh, well, boot camp was a mm -hmm. uh, great experience. Um, it really tested uh, me personally. Uh, very long days. Uh, Florida, uh, in the middle of summer, was very, very hot. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, to me, a phenomenal experience that had really influenced uh, me. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we, the folks I trained with, I was probably one of the older people mm -hmm. in the company, and there were about 80 of us. And out of the 80, uh, I want to say roughly six or seven of us were going back to civilian life as reservists, active reservists, and the remainder of our shipmates were going into the fleet as active duty sailors. Okay. Okay, you're back at Providence College. Tell, yes. us, tell us what happened next. Uh, at that point, uh, I was assigned. I had uh, two options, two mm -hmm. units I could go to. And um, one uh, was uh, NMCB 27, the CBs, which is Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 27. Mm -hmm. Or I could go to a CV-67, the USS Kennedy. So I had an option to go to either one of these units, mm -hmm. and I chose to go with the CVs. Now, why the CVs? I was very interested in what they did, and I thought it would be a, a great um, opportunity to learn some of the construction trade. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd always been <clears throat> interested in construction, and carpentry and building things. So I figured this was a great opportunity uh, as kind of my second job mm -hmm. and to learn much of the construction mm -hmm. trade. And uh, this, <clears throat> this was a um, really a pre-9-11 or a mm -hmm. Cold War uh, reserve unit. Right. So uh, much of what we did on the weekends was mm -hmm. uh, building. We built a lot of stuff. And when I did my annual training, mm -hmm. Um, we would go and work on construction projects uh, with the active duty military, the active duty CBs. Okay, you said you build a lot of stuff. What kind of stuff did you build? Oh, we, let's see, um, we would uh, at Hanscom Air Force Base, we, uh, we helped construct some buildings up there. And um, at one point, I remember our training, I went down to uh, Naval Air Station mm -hmm. uh, Oceana. And we were working on uh, actually the concession stands for so the Little League fields on the base there. And where is this? <clears throat> that was uh, Virginia. Oh, Virginia, okay. And uh, at one point for training, I went to uh, Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And when we were in Jamaica, we were working on uh, building uh, Jamaican Defense Force headquarters and also uh, reconstructing a school that had been damaged in a tropical storm. Mm -hmm. So you certainly got a lot of on-the-job training. A lot of on-the-job training, and mm -hmm. the CBs I worked with um, were outstanding, outstanding mm -hmm. uh, tradesmen, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, mechanics. Mm -hmm. So I was able to learn a lot from them, and I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, what were your like best skills? Carpentry, plumbing. Mo mostly um, as a as a uh, as a non-civilian mm -hmm. um, tradesman. Uh, pretty much a lot of what I was doing was like would be the equivalent of laboring. Right. Right. So okay. I'm pretty good at mixing mortar and mm -hmm. learned how to do roofing and framing and it was great. So tell us what happened next. Well, and so I did that for a total of eight years mm -hmm. and then decided as much as I enjoy it, uh, if I wanted to continue with my uh, military career, uh, mm -hmm. the best option. Um, would be to uh, look maybe at some other programs um, because where uh, where I was on the side I was a uh, when I was not uh, working with the uh, Navy and the CBs mm -hmm. after I graduated from college I became okay. a high school mm -hmm. teacher mm -hmm. so whereas most of my CB uh, shipmates uh, were working in the construction trade and I was not right there was only so much you could do so I figured if I wanted to continue mm -hmm. Um, in the Navy, which I did because I enjoyed so much of it, the camaraderie, the skills, um, that I would look at other types of programs. And I found a program uh, that would uh, bring you in and train you as an intelligence officer. And I applied for it. Okay. And you mentioned that you were teaching high school. Uh, where were you teaching? I was teaching at a school called a Newman Prep in Boston's Back Bay. Mm -hmm. And then I taught at my alma mater, a Catholic Memorial High School in West Roxbury. And what subjects? Uh, U.S. history, uh, government, and pretty much everything else in the social studies curriculum. Okay. But primarily uh, U.S. history and government. Mm -hmm. 
So you started in 1994. You've been doing this for about eight years. So this brings us up to around 2002. That's right. I have a I have a break in service, mm -hmm. and the break in service is because I had applied for a commission, mm -hmm. which at the time was taking they were taking quite a long time, and my reenlistment came up. And speaking with my recruiter, he thought it was best not to re-enlist, mm -hmm. but rather to just hold off until the commission came through. Okay, and when was this? Oh, this was, um, so that brings me to 2002, between 2002, 2004, roughly the paperwork mm -hmm. was being processed uh, for the commission. Okay. And it was his thought that had I re-enlisted, mm -hmm. that maybe there was a greater need uh, for enlistees and there was officers, mm -hmm. and that it would delay the commission process. Okay. So. Well, during this period, of course, September 11th happened. That's correct. Uh, what was your personal experience about for that? Well, I was. Uh, that was one of the reasons that I decided, made the conscious decision to uh, continue in the military, mm -hmm. uh, even though my time was coming to a close. Uh, my CB unit, uh, because of uh, being a pre-9-11 uh, reserve component, um, was not ready to be mobilized, as many mm -hmm. of the reserve units were not. So if some individuals were. I was not mobilized, but made the decision that, um, because of the war and terror, that uh, I wanted to continue my Navy, Navy mm -hmm. career uh, as an active reservist. Mm -hmm. Uh, obviously knowing that uh, you could be mobilized at any time. Right. Okay, tell us what happened next. Um, so anyway, um, while this is all going on, mm -hmm. I was also running for uh, office. Mm -hmm. um, so I had run for the uh, Boston City Council in 1999, unsuccessfully. And again mm -hmm. in 2001, unsuccessfully. And then um, within the year, I uh, ran for the state legislature and was elected as a state representative mm -hmm. in 2002. Representing West Roxbury? Representing, uh, yes, mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood of West Roxbury mm -hmm. in the city of Boston, part of the neighborhood of Rosendale in the city of Boston and uh, South Brookline, the town of Brookline. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I got elected uh, there in 2002 mm -hmm. and did that uh, up until 2010. My commissioning came back through uh, during this time frame uh, so that, um, I forget the exact date, but it was around 2004. Um, so it was almost a, almost a two-year lull mm -hmm. in the commissioning process. Uh, and again, very slow at the time because there were questions, I think, about manpower. Right. So uh, had I not got the commissioning, I most likely would have re-enlisted, mm -hmm. but uh, was pretty confident the commissioning was going to come through. And, and, and I had learned a lot about the intel community mm -hmm. uh, through a friend of mine who had been, in, uh, been in, in the intel community. And I figured it was a, a great way that I, with my teaching background uh, and having a master's degree in history, um, could, could benefit the Navy, so. Okay. So. so you received your commission around 2004? Around 2004. And what were you commissioned as? I was commissioned as a uh, ensign, United States Naval Reserve Intelligence Officer. Did you receive training for this? Uh, the training program mm -hmm. uh, was about almost a two-year program uh, conducted mostly at Fort Devens and also down at uh, Little Creek, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of formalized training and then a lot of, uh, as the military is accustomed to, on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. What did you learn? Um, you know, basically how to become an intel analyst. Uh -huh. And um, you know a lot of training about how the Navy does their intel uh, collections and mm -hmm. uh, dissemination, and then how intel um, really drives the military. Mm -hmm. So before 
moves can be made. Uh, it's important that there's actionable uh, intelligence has been collected. All right, what happened next? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, I get assigned to uh, the Joint Central Command. And where was this? This uh, the reserve component was at uh, Fort Devens in Massachusetts. And I drilled with a great unit up there. And they were supporting uh, CENTCOM uh, down mm -hmm. in Florida. So we were doing a lot of analysis and a lot of work for our active duty uh, counterparts. And uh, very, very enjoyable. Worked with outstanding individuals, mm -hmm. both uh, enlisted and officers. Uh, and did that uh, for a while, and then was interested in taking the skills that I learned uh, both in the training mm -hmm. and working with JICSINT um, to uh, go to another unit. So I applied to go to another unit, and uh, this unit was stationed uh, in Newport, uh, Rhode Island, and it, is a, it was a NATO unit. So we as reserve intelligence officers uh, in, uh, in this mm -hmm. unit were supporting NATO uh, exercises around mm -hmm. Europe. And I had a great opportunity to work with uh, our NATO counterparts. Mm -hmm. So I was working with uh, the militaries of uh, England and Spain and Italy and Germany mm -hmm. and many other European countries. And many of the exercises they do, because uh, we're reserved, although we're reservists, mm -hmm. our NATO uh, counterparts are all active duty. So we would train with them to help train them and work with them on these exercises uh, to prepare them for their mobilizations. Uh, so I had great opportunities to go to uh, Stavanger, Norway, do some training there. And I was in uh, Northwood, England. Mm -hmm. I get to do training there. And I was in uh, uh, Germany several times as well to do training. Uh, and I found the NATO units to be uh, outstanding. Great, great individuals, very committed, very dedicated. And it, they enjoyed uh, working with the Americans as much as we did with them. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning um, military exercises. Uh, could you describe what, uh, what kind of duties you had while you were bouncing around Europe? Sure, sure. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, NATO participates in exercises uh, year round mm -hmm. to uh, basically for the reasons of being prepared so when NATO forces get called up so as an intel officer I would mm -hmm. support these exercises and they would have uh, various scenarios of things that could happen that would draw in NATO um, including the US as mm -hmm. part of NATO and um, and um, and we would, we would work out these scenarios and how things would work. It was much like uh, war gaming is what it was. Right, so. okay. Of course, during this time, the United States is getting further involved in Iraq and Afghanistan. There is that uh, nice little battlefront down there. And That's correct. Uh, when were you sent to Iraq? Well, so uh, mm -hmm. as a reservist, mm -hmm. uh, there was not a drill weekend that we would go to and uh, basically drill first weekend of every month, 12 months a year, mm -hmm. and then training of uh, two weeks to up to 29 days a year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's serious time commitment there in right. addition to uh, family life and civilian mm -hmm. uh, life. Um, so uh, there was not a drill weekend where we would hear you know, somebody may get, may get mobilized, so just be ready. Mm -hmm. And we were constantly training since 9-11. Right. Uh, all the reserve units, uh, the, the, the main goal, the reserve units, in addition to your training duty, was mobilization preparedness. Mm -hmm. So we were always, that was always uh, focus number one. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of my shipmates in the Navy, uh, we'd show up to drill weekend and they would find out they're getting mobilized. And the majority of the uh, mobilizations were for a year, minimally mm -hmm. one year for the Navy, and uh, most of what the Navy was doing uh, in terms of mobilizations were augmenting uh, the Army mm -hmm. uh, as uh, individual augmentees. So uh, somebody from the Navy would be taken out of their Navy unit, and they would go and fill a job of an Army uh, personnel. And uh, that was happening very, very frequently. So I found out um, I was elected to the State Senate I served in the House of Representatives uh, yep. for, for eight years. 
2010, I ran, was elected to the Massachusetts State Senate, representing the Suffolk and Norfolk District, which included about 50% of my district was in the city of Boston, uh, West Rochford, Rosendale, uh, Hyde Park, part of Jamaica Plain, mm -hmm. and then the towns of Dedham, Westwood, and Norwood. Um, so I was elected to the Senate, and then uh, in 2011 was mobilized as an individual augmentee. And what was interesting, mm -hmm. uh, on a side note, is during 2011, uh, three members of the Massachusetts legislature were mobilized, two to Iraq and one to Afghanistan. So truly the essence of the citizen, soldier, sailor. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I left in 2011 mm -hmm. and was pretty much on active duty orders for the year. I did my training in uh, February at uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I was processed. I, you go to a Naval Mobilization Processing Center, an MPC, mm -hmm. yep. and that was at uh, Norfolk, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And that's for all the folks on the East Coast who are mm -hmm. mobilized. To get ready, you do some training uh, through your, uh, where you drill, your NOSC, they call it, it's a mm -hmm. Navy Operations Support Center. So initially I did some training there. <clears throat> then I get processed in Norfolk in uh, February. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Fort Jackson, yep. South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, reserve uh, Navy folks and active duty Navy folks mm -hmm. come together mm -hmm. and train with the Army. Okay. And we are uh, basically uh, the purpose of this training is to get us up to speed on uh, weapons and how to integrate into Army life. So you have all these sailors who only know the way of the Navy and you go to Fort Jackson to mm -hmm. be integrated into the Army. And uh, while at Fort Jackson, uh, my father, while I was doing my training, uh, it got interrupted because my, my father passed away mm -hmm. in February. So I came uh, back home uh, for his wake and funeral mm -hmm. and, uh, and then back to training. And at this point, uh, I uh, had been married um, and my wife and I uh, had a five-month-old when I got mobilized. So, Kira Rose was a five month months old. So, uh, my wife was wonderful because she always knew. Because when we dated, mm -hmm. uh, she knew I was in the reserves, and she knew this is, as with every reservist, is chance she could be mobilized. Mm -hmm. uh, so she, um, you know, it was no. Although there's always a little bit of initial shock because you think maybe other folks are going and not you. Uh, she was absolutely wonderful. It was a very very difficult time. Uh, having training interrupted uh, with my father, who I was very, very close to. Right. Um, so that was, that was a tough time in my life. Um, he was buried in February, and I resumed training. And uh, in March, I uh, went to uh, the Middle East. As part of your training, to, to head to the Middle East, were you given um, lessons on cultural differences? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So some of it was cultural training. Uh, in addition to uh, a lot of the training, they have uh, Humvee rollover exercises, which was a big issue uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. If a IED, a roadside bomb, uh, hits, a, hits you while you're in a Humvee. So there was that type of training. Uh, we carried an extensive amount of gear with mm -hmm. us uh, from deployment. I had, uh, I think we had five sea bags full of gear, a six sea bags, so it's a lot of material. About a lot 5, of sea 000, bags. <laughs> about $5,000 worth of uh, equipment uh -huh. we carried with us. Um, and those were uh, uniforms, body armor. Mm -hmm. um, we were issued uh, weapons to, uh, to, for, for the whole deployment. Um, so uh, you, you get trained up on all this equipment. Spent a lot of time uh, on the ranges, firing all the weapons. Um, the M9 uh, rifle was the big, uh, big uh, 
big thing that everyone mm -hmm. had to be trained up on. Um, and most Navy personnel are trained up on firing pistols, so. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we trained on all the weapons. We trained on, uh, you know, heat training, Humvee, uh, uh, convoying, cultural differences. So there was a lot of, uh, lot of training. It was fairly intense, long days. And much like back in boot camp, uh, we slept in an open bay barracks. So it was kind of like uh, going back to uh, square one. So I, I was in a uh, barracks with all, uh, I, at this time I was a uh, 03, a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And all the lieutenants were in one, uh, one barracks. So getting this intense training and uh, spent a lot of time when I wasn't training. Uh, just keep my mind off of things, missing a five month old, missing my wife, my mom, my mm -hmm. dad having passed, uh, so I just spent a lot of time uh, when I was in training, exercising, reading, mm -hmm. things like that. So uh, just all kind of getting prepared to head to the Middle East. So. Okay, so in March you're deployed, and where did you land? So I landed in um, Kuwait mm -hmm. through Germany. We stopped in Germany to refuel. And we landed in Kuwait because it was one last step of in-processing in Kuwait. And a lot of the traveling, if you weren't in a Humvee, sometimes you travel in these giant uh, armored vehicles called an MRAP, so we had to do the MRAP training if those would have roll over. Because you're all buckled in in a, in a five point harness. Mm -hmm. So you have to know how to get out of these vehicles if they roll over before right. they explode. So we did some of that, a little bit of the desert heat training very short period of time in Kuwait, and then from there uh, to Baghdad. So when did you get to Baghdad? Baghdad in March, the end of March. It was the end of March, okay. And what did you do in Baghdad? Uh, in Baghdad, I was assigned um, to uh, a MIT team, which is a military transition team. So the Army had all these small teams mm -hmm. of uh, soldiers who were working with the Iraqis. So our MIT team, and it was uh, trying to get a military transition team, trying to make sure the Iraqis were in good shape mm -hmm. uh, when we left, when the, when the final pullout came. So my MIT team that I was assigned to I was a, a targeting officer and an intel officer. And we worked with the Iraqis uh, each and every day at uh, Iraq Counterterrorism Forces. And what was that experience like? It's pretty wild. Um, for me, uh, it, was, it was an adventure, without a doubt. Uh, and there's always kind of every day you're not sure what tomorrow will bring and that was the whole deployment process for me. Um, but I get to work with outstanding, outstanding uh, Army personnel as well as there were two of us in the Navy who were assigned uh, to this MIT team. Mm -hmm. And there's a few Air Force folks but the MIT team that we worked on were uh, Army Special Forces, the Green Berets. Mm -hmm. So we worked with both 5th group and 10th group uh, through their mobilizations. Mm -hmm. uh, so I get to work with these phenomenal, uh, really the best of the best, these Green Beret, Special Forces, Army individuals uh, who were just phenomenal to work with. I learned so much mm -hmm. and um, they were just terrific and they treated us as sailors. Um, they treated us wonderfully and, mm -hmm. and lear we learned a lot from them. Um, that I think maybe even folks who are just regular army and not in the special forces are things that they would not be familiar with as well. What was Baghdad like in 2011? Um, I was stationed in what they called um, the IZ, mm -hmm. so the International Zone. It was formerly known as the Green Zone, but there came a point uh, prior to my arriving where U.S. security forces no longer um, were responsible for the security of this area. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it went from being known as a green zone to the IZ. So 
So instead of U.S. Uh, personnel um, patrolling who would come in and come out, we had turned that function back over to the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. So there was always a level of danger. Uh, because of that, And if you were in Baghdad uh, in 2011, you were generally, you were either in the IZ, the international zone, on one side of Baghdad, mm -hmm. or you were over at the major uh, U.S. base where the airfield was on the other side, which was uh, Saddam Hussein Airport. Um, so um, you basically were on one side of Baghdad or the other. Okay. And I was on the, uh, the smaller side of things, mm -hmm. uh, but where they had built the brand new embassy. I was not far, I did not live uh, far from the embassy, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and also a base known as uh, FOB, a uh, Forward Operating Base Union 3. So that was kind of the big military base. I lived uh, on a very small uh, compound uh, with um, the folks on this MIT team as well as uh, some, some American civilians who worked with uh, other government agencies. So we worked on this small, uh, lived on this small compound, mm -hmm. uh, but every day I worked on an Iraqi compound. Mm -hmm. And what did you do at the Iraqi compound? So the Iraqi compound, um, our team, uh, our primary goal was to help uh, the Iraqis uh, in stopping terrorism in Baghdad and throughout Iraq and trying to teach the Iraqis uh, how the U.S. stops these types of attacks and it uh, deals with uh, collecting intelligence and then acting on the intelligence. Mm -hmm. So as targeting officers we would help them uh, locate uh, the bad, bad folks if you will and then at night uh, the Iraqis and the special forces would go out and capture the bad guys. Mm -hmm. So during the day our process was was getting 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 all that information together so that they mm -hmm. could take the intelligence that we put together working with them and then at night uh, go out mm -hmm. uh, under the cover of darkness, the helicopters, much as like folks have seen, and then round mm -hmm. up uh, the terrorists. Often when we get media reports about, oh, there was another explosion in Baghdad, sure. oh, there was an IED in, in the international zone, or some, something would happen. Do you believe the media reports were accurate? It, it was funny being uh, there, mm -hmm. because one of the things we would do uh, is, as intel officers is we would constantly track uh, open source media so like the major news outlets and what they were reporting, mm -hmm. and try to match it up as to whether it was correct based on our intel. And it generally was, uh, they, were, they were good in reporting that something did happen, but the mm -hmm. facts maybe weren't always so good. Mm -hmm. So, or it was quite delayed from when it actually did, did occur. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with the, the local populace? Sure, the Iraqi, um, mm -hmm. the Iraqi soldiers we worked with, um, uh, it could be complicated at times mm -hmm. because of the cultural differences. Uh, but for the most part, our Iraqi counterparts had the same goals that we did. Stop mm -hmm. terrorism. Uh, they all had families they cared about. Mm -hmm. They all wanted peace. And the Iraqis that I worked with um, at least relayed to us that they were very pro-United States. Mm -hmm and they were very grateful for what we had done to get rid of Saddam Hussein. But many of them would say they struggled uh, with, with democracy. It was new concepts for them and to have gained it so quickly was mm -hmm. difficult. Uh, but many of the Iraqi soldiers I worked with uh, had been in Saddam Hussein's regime and they would relay many stories about what that was like and how they, they much more so are enjoying their freedom and their democracy, mm -hmm. but with that comes challenges uh, to them as well. Right. But my Iraqi, they were great. Uh, they would love to sit down with you and talk, and they wanted to know everything about the United States. Very, very interested in our lives as much as we were with theirs. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, one of their favorite things would be to, if they could engage you to have a cup of chai, which is tea. Um, so they, they really enjoyed that. So they were mm -hmm. very hospitable, and they love um, sharing a meal or having a cup of chai mm -hmm. and talking. They really enjoyed it. And um, there were some great relationships developed uh, with myself, those members of my team, and the Iraqis. Mm -hmm. Of course, you being a teacher and also involved in local politics, did your experience relate well to uh, what you were going through in Iraq? It, it, it really did. It was fascinating. It was a fascinating experience or mm -hmm. uh, adventure in my life. Uh, and I tried every day to make the most of it and learn as much as I possibly could. Mm -hmm. And I tried to write down as much as I could and take as many pictures as I could uh, for the experience. Um, because I figured it was just once in a lifetime opportunity mm -hmm. to be in Baghdad as the war was coming to a close and as we were trying to help our allies, mm -hmm. the Iraqi military, uh, in preparing for what was to come when we pulled out. So uh, as a teacher and as an elected official, uh, I found it fascinating and I really tried to uh, relish every, every minute of it. Okay. And how long were you in Baghdad? I left Baghdad in November, the end of November, and then was in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. And because of the pullout, I was home by Christmas. So that was not the original intended plan, but I was very grateful for, to the president mm -hmm. for altering the plans. And I left at the very end after Thanksgiving I left Baghdad. I celebrated Thanksgiving with the Iraqis in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. They cooked turkey, and we ate a lot of hummus and fish. Uh, so I had Thanksgiving dinner with the Iraqis, mm -hmm. and um, and then was home. I uh, did this transition back, back into Kuwait, and then back to Norfolk, Virginia, mm -hmm. and then finally arrived. Uh, a little over a week before Christmas, 10 days before Christmas, to see my daughter, who had changed considerably, mm -hmm. uh, and my wife, and that was phenomenal. But the, uh, the experience in Baghdad uh, was, was really something else. Mm -hmm. And um, I really enjoyed uh, working with these individuals and, and think we made a, a difference, so, which was great. Okay. So now you're a state senator. Yes. You, of course, and your district's just have been uh, changed a bit. That's correct. You are also still in the Naval Reserve. I am. What are you doing these days? Well, um, since I've been home uh, from deployment in 2011, mm -hmm. <clears throat> had, a, had a couple months of downtime and then resumed uh, drilling as an active reservist with my NATO unit. Mm-hmm. And I did that for a while. And then uh, we like moving to different units. Nobody likes to get, you're not, not good for your career to stay in any unit too long. Um, so we, um, I, I applied to go to another unit. And I'm, I'm currently assigned with the Office of Naval Intelligence, which drills at the Naval War College um, at Newport, Rhode Island. And within. Uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence. I'm assigned currently to what they call the, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations uh, mm -hmm. Strategic Studies Group. Mm -hmm. So uh, the unit I work with, we uh, report uh, indirectly the Chief of Naval Operations through this Strategic Study Group. Okay. And for the State House, you are also the Senate Chairman for the Joint Committee on Veterans and Federal Affairs. That's correct. Tell us a little more about that. Well, uh, currently, out of the 40 members of the State Senate, uh, I'm the only uh, member who's a veteran. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Senate President thought, because of my background and my experience, that it would be fitting for me to chair the Committee on Veterans and Federal Affairs, mm -hmm. uh, which I enjoy chairing tremendously. It's a great committee. And I was actually in the House of Representatives when a group of us with military backgrounds, petition the Senate and House leadership to create a Committee on Veterans Affairs mm -hmm. because of the large increase of veterans we have now from 9-11. And prior to that, all veterans issues would just help 
were heard in a committee on health and human services. So we thought it was important with almost mm -hmm. half a million veterans in Massachusetts. We still have World War II veterans, mm -hmm. Korean, Vietnam, Gulf War, and 9-11 uh, and beyond. So it's been a great experience mm -hmm. chairing this committee. And I've had uh, one, one of the things that has been nice, and I've been able to keep in touch with many of the folks I served with in Iraq through the internet and through Facebook. And uh, not too long ago, mm -hmm. uh, an Army major who I served with was visiting Boston from California. And he came to the State House, and I was able to introduce him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me he was still in contact with uh, some of the Iraqis we worked with, and that they were, they were despite much of the media, mm -hmm. uh, the, these individuals were OK. They were safe. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Much of the attacks you still hear going on over there. Right. Uh, uh, again, a little more about the committee on which you're serving. Sure. Uh, what kind of programs uh, or what kind of, what, tell me some of the issues. Well, I'm proud to say that if you were to rank all 50 states against each other in which states provide the best veteran services, mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts has consistently been number one. Uh, but that hasn't been good enough as far as I'm concerned, so we continue mm -hmm. to move forward to make sure that we're, we are number one. Mm -hmm. And our Secretary of Veterans Affairs will tell us that when he travels to other states, folks are always uh, praising him on what we do for vets here in Massachusetts. So when I came home from Iraq, we did a large omnibus bill um, in the legislature known as the Valor Act. And just last week, now this is a session later, uh, last week we passed in the Senate a second Valor Act, which has over 30 provisions uh, giving assistance to our veterans and their families mm -hmm. in areas of employment, homelessness, mental health issues, health issues, um, other types of resources um, for our vets and their families. So mm -hmm. we're very proud of, of the work that's being done and uh, have a phenomenal staff and great members on the committee and the Senate. Uh, President Therese Murray, and the Speaker of the House, uh, Speaker DeLeo, are very supportive mm -hmm. of, su of supporting vets in Massachusetts. So we, these two pieces of legislation we've done in the last two sessions are more and have done more for veterans than probably half a, half the last half century. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a veteran, did you get your $1,000 bonus? Uh, um, great question. I actually have not put in for that yet. Yes. Um, and that's great. We, uh, one of the first big pieces we did was a welcome home bill mm -hmm. back when I was a member of the committee, but not the chairman, prior to going to Iraq. And every Massachusetts service person who's been deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan come home and will be thanked with a $1,000 check. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have not put in for it, and I actually need to, and I have uh, <laughs> promised myself that I will mm -hmm. give that check to my wife, whatever she mm -hmm. would like to do with it. So. I'm sure your wife would appreciate it greatly. <laughs> she deserves it. She yes. absolutely does. And you were recently promoted to lieutenant commander. In August, I found out that I was uh, promoted to lieutenant commander in the United States Navy. Mm -hmm. So I will pin that on this, this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. They have a phase-in ceremony, but uh, I was promoted on my first look. And... Um, so I had to submit all my information and all, everything I did on my deployment to Iraq, mm -hmm. the work I did, my fitness reports from Iraq. Um, so that all went into getting this look for promotion, and I was uh, promoted, and I'm very happy about that. Okay. How important is it, has it been to you to serve in the military? It has, to me, it's uh, very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something I, I grew up with looking at my father uh, and his mm -hmm. siblings, my grandfather. And uh, my father, when I told him that I wanted to join the Navy, uh, did not think it was such a great idea. He thought because he had served that it wasn't really necessary for his children to serve. Mm. And out of the six, uh, I'm the youngest of six children. So I'm the only one who has uh, served in the military. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but he, that was kind of his attitude. He went and his oldest siblings went um, so that it wasn't, wasn't necessary. But I remember uh, the smile on his face when he came to my pass and review at boot camp. Mm -hmm. And he and my mother, and he was grinning ear to ear, mm -hmm. and he was so proud and so happy. And mm -hmm. that in turn made me so happy. And I remember that actually just the other day as a neighbor of mine uh, who told me his son is graduating uh, this coming weekend mm -hmm. from boot camp at Great Lakes. Oh, wow. He said he and his wife had not been on a plane in 30 years. <laughs> And they were flying to the pass and review, and all I could think back was that day mm -hmm. uh, when my parents were there and how happy they both were uh, that I had graduated from boot camp in the United States Navy. Mm. So it's been very important to, to me as a person, um, mostly because of what I've learned, the people I've served with, and I think uh, we've done uh, some great work collectively and continue to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, I am proud of our active duty folks. Uh, who are great to work with, but I'm also proud of our reserve folks because of the work that they do in addition to their civilian careers. And the reserves have played an extremely vital role since 9-11. Mm -hmm. And uh, as folks will say, it's an entire a volunteer force. There's nobody serving who doesn't want to serve. And to me, that's something uh, pretty special because we're the greatest military the history of the world, argu arguably, mm -hmm. and uh, really it's the individuals who sacrifices, uh, and they do it because they love our country, and they have uh, had this commitment to serve, and mm -hmm. uh, as you know, through this project, uh, there's only, uh, I think it's been said, 1% of our population uh, who have served, so I'm very, very proud to be part of that 1%. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself uh, serving in the Naval Reserves in the foreseeable future? I do. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, what, what I've gotten to learn, it's, it's a great opportunity mm -hmm. um, to have this second job uh, in addition to my civilian career. Mm -hmm. uh, so have this second job equally is important. Um, in, in, the folks I work with and the training we do and the contribution that is made by the group as a whole mm -hmm. I see is very worthwhile and uh, very fulfilling for me personally. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy it and, and to think in the big picture of what we as a group, what we as a Navy are doing and all of our armed forces to protect democracy and freedom here at home and mm -hmm. around the world and as I look at my children, uh, as I'm sure my father did, looking mm. at me uh, gives me great self-satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Mike, is there anything you would like to add before we wrap up this interview? Um, that, that I can think of in okay. particular. I think we covered most things. All but right. I almost forgot to ask, um, have you joined any other military organizations, uh, VFW, Legion? I'm a member of uh, both the American Legion, mm -hmm. Veterans of Foreign War, and the Iraq, Afghanistan Veterans of America. And these always have been and continue to be outstanding organizations that advocate uh, for vets. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's something you know, very special about going to a VFW hall, American Legion hall, mm -hmm. and being a, for me, uh, as, a, as a history teacher, as a naval officer, being able to talk to some of our World War II, Korean, mm -hmm. Vietnam veterans and listening to their experiences. To me, it's very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. And that also brings me great satisfaction um, in my role as chairman of the Committee on Veterans Affairs. Mm -hmm. But uh, one, one thing I said when I came home after deployment, and I'll continue to say it, is that I think the toughest role in the military is that of the military spouse. And I just think uh, of the work uh, that my wife did while I was gone with a young child. And I can relate to that personally. Mm -hmm. And that is going on all over the world, mm. every single state, every, so many service members who have done multiple deployments. And there are many folks uh, in the active duty Army who very short time, they're home, then back to another deployment, another deployment, another mm. deployment, because it is an all-volunteer force. So certainly uh, the toughest job is being a spouse. And when there are children at home, 
uh, that, that, that individual uh, takes on so many roles. Uh, so I, I, I will never be able to uh, you know, express enough gratitude to the military spouses mm -hmm. uh, and, for the, and for what they do. What is your wife's name, by the way? My wife's name is Mary uh, mm -hmm. Kate Rush. So. Well, give her a big thanks as well. I, I, I certainly will. And State Senator Mike Rush, we thank you so much for coming in and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Maureen, Project. thank you so much. Thank this you. is a pleasure. Okay. Awesome.